Hi, I'm Harry Gregson Williams and Spitfire arrived at my door, so I thought, well, I could leave them on the doorstep, but probably best to bring them in. Um, so there's a little reception area. We can back up a bit. We'll go and visit Steph, who's my musical assistant. She's going to be in here. <laughs> Are you being musical, Steph? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is Steph's boudoir. Uh, the machine runs over there, you don't want to talk about that. Um, Paul is uh, my um, tech, my technical assistant. He's usually here, but he's not here today. Um, he's sick. So let's go up to my room. It's a beautiful day here in California. Um, so, oh yeah, well there's a... There's a there's a little overdub booth in there. It's got my drums set up and a couple of things. Nice old roads, a couple of amps. So I feed my signal through my rooms through the glass there. And here we are. So this is my composing room. Um, I don't mix my scores here. I actually, uh, I used to have a big old studio on Venice Beach and uh, plenty of space and manpower in which to have a mix room there. But um, uh, after I took a sabbatical a few years ago, um, I disbanded that, thought that was a bad idea. I'm not a mini Hans Zimmer <coughs> and I shouldn't try and be. Um, so this is a much smaller concern, cottage industry, not a factory. Um, and that's the way I like it. So my mix room actually, I rent a room at a recording studio called The Village. In, um, in West Los Angeles, uh, and uh, it's a good room actually. Thomas Newman had it before me, so it's got to have a bit of pedigree. Um, and I put my, my mixing desk or whatever it is, and uh, my Quested's in there. So when I, I go in there about three or four times a year to mix, um, and otherwise it's dormant. So I realized that I should probably let someone, a needy person, have that studio while I'm not in it. At the moment, there's a DJ called Sasha, uh, who's become a good friend of mine, who's moved to LA and needed somewhere to put his stuff down, so he's in there. And some, some, a few synths kicking around, um, and uh, all my score, what, what, the great thing about doing a sabbatical um, is that everything had to be packed up in Venice, and in a nearly 20 years of scores, lit physical scores, um, and CDs and soundtracks and God knows what, that all, they all had to be organized and uh, stored away while I was away for a year. Um, and so they, they, uh, they're up there in, in meticulous condition, I have to say. Um, so I'm very happy about that. So my piano was the first musical instrument I bought uh, as soon as I could afford it, which is about two and a half, three years after I came to LA. Because, you know, I was surviving on water and bread, sale bread uh, from Hans at the time. Um, and I suddenly realized there were no musical instruments at Media Ventures. So um, as soon as I was able to, um, I invested in this lovely beast here, and it's got the uh, old schnoodle on the side, can't remember what you call it, uh, but it, it, uh, you know, it'll play by itself. You know, if, <laughs> if you're getting a pickle on a score, it's like, over to you, mate. Um, no, it'll, it'll record, you know, I often improvise um, at the piano uh, and try and find, find some way into my movie, and I find it really helpful just to have this little geezer in record the whole time, in case something wonderful happens. I don't want to stop. You know, 10 minutes later, I'm like, what was that wonderful thing? But now I can zip back and find out that it actually wasn't that wonderful. Um, it should probably just be left where it was. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not that keen on Yamaha, it's got to be said, um, because they're very bright. But it's the one that I could afford at the time. Um, and uh, it's been really good for me. I've probably been on every score I've done. But I tend to do something heinous to it once I've recorded it. Like, you know, if that's your EQ line, I kind of go, <laughs> take the top off and I, I like it to sound as woody and nutty as possible. Uh, yeah, a sort of, uh, yeah, really warm sound and very close. As you can see, I stick the microphones right up its hooter there. So, um, um, and often I'll record it with the lid down, or as down as it will go um, towards those mics. And they're not special mics, but I don't, I'm a firm believer in, in, uh, in the, <laughs> in not worrying too much about the sort of technology or the methods. Um, I'm more about the musical content and hopefully it'll win through. So, I mean, if I play something 
a bit average on the piano, no matter how good the bloody mics are. Um, I'd rather I'd rather be um, I'd rather be focusing my energies on on the content, especially now as I go further on into my American adventure here, my film score adventure. Now I'm trying to do fewer movies and do them better. Uh, simple as that. Simple equation. Uh, and for that, um, yeah, I don't want to get too complicated. So generally, actually, there's a cue up on my desktop here, which is I probably recorded piano on. Um, and we, uh, have I recorded piano? Yes, here it is, there's a piano track. So we can have a look, ooh, look, it's got a little bit of even tide on it, uh, which is my, my kind of, um, yeah, my go-to reverb, which is that housed over there. It's a black hole, um, uh, which I've tweaked just a little bit. There's a preset called black hole, which I love. It's very long reverb, but uh, I've got a little bit of modulation going on it. Uh, after the event, which I love the way it kind of falls off in pitch. Um, so that's that's that. So that's the story of my piano. Actually, you know, the reason I, I, I like a woody sound, I think it's because because I was brought up on, uh, brought up playing on my dad's piano, which was a, famously in our, in our, in our family, he won, well, he didn't win, he won a bunch of money uh, by backing a hundred to one winner at the Grand National. And he bought himself a Broadwood piano. So that was before I was born, I think. Uh, so that's quite a while ago. Um, and uh, that piano is the one that I grew up playing, the Broadwood, and it had this beautiful woody sound. Not very bright, uh, warm sound. And uh, so I kind of gravitate towards that. And the more I think about it, actually, with my compositions, uh, I can, you know, I, I can trace why I'm doing what I'm doing back to my early days with my parents and my brothers and sister because there was always music in my house and my sister played really quite lovely clarinet. Again, a real woody, beautiful sound. And I, I you know, I used the Spitfire um, clarinet, but uh, it takes you a while to find the things that work for you. And uh, it's, it's, it's still evolving for me, my studio. And, uh, and it's, you know, I, I really love coming to my studio and try and write music almost every day. Um, and uh, now I have this lovely little home studio attached to my house. Um, you know, I did most of the Martian in my gym jams, actually, uh, <laughs> in the middle of the night. Well, you see, I have got five children, and three of them are quite small. Um, so they're awake quite a lot at night. Um, in terms of hardware, I've re returned to this guy, uh, which I rather like, um, which I find really easy to program. Uh, you know, because I like buttons you can press. <laughs> uh, I've always liked that. I've always liked, um, you know, for instance, I, I love this little boy over here, um, which is obviously a, uh, I like the fact that I can, I can just access, um, and I don't know how Paul got my studio set up, but I, on my template, for instance, if I want to play The Prophet, let's have a look here, see if I can find it. I go to synths, uh, actually go to keyboards, Oh, there they are, keyboard synths. Uh, so, uh, where is it? Profit. So I could play from here, uh, but but I could actually, I don't know what he's got going here. It says Profit Remote. All I know is that, for instance, if I go into record here, I can now record from here. And, and it should, it theoretically, <laughs> we should see all these little controller movements in here. So what I do now is to pull this track up to the profit track and it'll now be playing what I did over there. But my, the, the way I liked it set up is that I can move around my studio and I should, I should I'll be able to be into record on, on, on anything that I touch. The idea is that if I touch something, <laughs> it, it, it's being captured. Uh, I like that, yeah. So, um, and I, you know, I, I use the, Cubase, I, I, you know, Hans, I, when, I, when I came to LA in 1995, I didn't think I'd used a computer in music at all at that point. I don't think I owned a computer. In fact, I didn't own a computer. Uh, I had no idea how you, you, you uh, the, the first couple of BBC things I had done just before I came to America at the, uh, what was then the Snake Ranch, Richard's Harvest Studio, um, I did it on MC50. I think someone showed me how to do that, and I, it was a horribly complicated thing. I wasn't really into it, but I was able to just about sequence a few things. I had two 760s, Roland 760s, which had just come out. Um, and I wheel on two years, in 1995 I got here, and then Hans, Hans, to be Hans's musical assistant, which is what I was, you know, and it was just me as his composing assistant, 
um, at the time. Nick Lenny Smith was the outgoing because, you know, he kind of graduated, as it were. And I was the incoming. Um, Streitenfeld was the tech. Um, it was a very small team. But in order to effectively help Hans, I need to have the same setup as he had. And, you know, the guy had this monstrous setup and forgetting his synths and stuff, which obviously, you know, these walls of uh, modular synths, not that so much, but like the samples, the orchestra. But in order to house that, he was like, okay, well, you need to have a tower of 27 760s. And I said, well, that ain't going to happen, Hans, because, um, you know, I think I've got about uh, $1,500 in the bank and that's it. And they were about 3,500 without the memory. And to get the right amount of memory in that was another thousand dollars. So you can imagine a rack of 27 of the damn things. But he, he marched me along to Bank of America and co-signed for me. Um, and they, Bank of America lent me the money and uh, you know, I paid them back. But he, but, uh, so I, I've actually got rid of it. It, it was housed in that rack there. I've now got some, some synths in there, but there were 27 of those little blighters. I think I've got one left now. <laughs> But, but I, I got rid of I got rid of them all. Um, I got rid of them all when uh, when I did uh, went on my sabbatical, um, and I think my tech at the time, I put them on eBay, sold them for about I don't know, thirty five bucks each. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the story of them. But it did what it did do was it allowed me to access samples that I never would have you know to, and have a certain sound, and it was from that that I you know I learned the discipline of of programming and and Hans's way of doing that. You know people often say to me. You know, do you feel, uh, uh, you know, does your music echo Hans's? I, I've never thought it necessarily did. Uh, but the way that I'm making my demos, absolutely, he taught me from beginning to end. You know, I wouldn't have known how, how, how do you learn how to program, how to manipulate sounds. But he showed me that very thoroughly and was very generous with his time and um, energy. Uh, but, you know, from a musical point of view, I don't th I've never really tried to be a mini Hans and do that, do his sort of thing. Uh, so that's been quite convenient for me, just to veer off and try and make my own way. But uh, over there, the, yeah, the, the synths on the walls, they all, have, they all have their purposes for me. Um, <laughs> and some, some of them are woefully under, uh, underused. This little boy here provided one really thick, analog sounding uh, pad, uh, sort of brassy pad thing on the Martian. Uh, but it really hasn't paid its way yet. <laughs> it's so damn complicated. I can't. Um, the, I've always enjoyed these things, these, these boys here, these viruses. Um, I've I always thought they make a fat sound. They're really easy to use for me. Again, twiddling knobs. It's, it's so, so straightforward for me. Save a sound, twiddle, save. Um, that's it. I used to have a bunch of Nord things, but uh, I got one up there and I got, I got a modular one somewhere. Oh, it's underneath there. Um, but I was, the, the, my, the first Nord I owned, um, I really thought I had, should have some red in my studio, and that was why I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> it worked really well. It's black and red go really well. Um, and I re really liked it. Um, what else can I talk about? How I love my Quested's. Uh, when I first started with Hans, you know, he gave me a pair of Auratones, and I nearly gave up. It's like, oh, God, is that what music sounds like? Um, but, you know, he was scratching around. I, didn't, I couldn't afford to buy anything. He was giving me stuff that was lying around in the, in the, in the sort of storage rooms. But... Um, that was, I think it was him who suggested, he got some of uh, these Quested things. And of course, it's a, Roger Quest is a very English guy. He, um, uh, but, you know, he, he, he's, he's uh, let's say, in the twilight of his career now. So it's quite difficult to get. We, we, the last time we went back to them for a bunch of spare tweeters and all sorts of stuff. So we, we, if something goes wrong, we, we can fix them up. But uh, I love them. I, uh, in my mix room, I have the, 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 the grand ones. These are kind of the smaller, close monitoring ones. Uh, and do you work in 5.1 when you're writing? No, never. No. Never. I find I can't, I, because most of the samples and all of the synths just about are stereo, I find it really distracting. There was a moment uh, a few years ago when, uh, you know, I remember saying to my tech at the time, why am I, why am I, you know, like on my, uh, some piano part I'd recorded, why am I putting a stereo reverb on it when we come to mix, you, you know, the, uh, Mix in 5.1, that comes off, and then some fancy lexicon box that can deal with a 5.1 reverb is then put on. And the mixer, the engineer, never does it exactly how I would like it. Why can't I be doing that? So he said, well, you can. Reactor has a really nice 5.1 reverb. And he set me up with that, but it sounded daft, man. When I was, because let's face it, the, the, the first point of call is to, 
is to have a cue signed off on with the director, right, isn't it? Uh, so if he's sitting here, which he would be, on a little wheelie chair, and everything's coming from here, and suddenly there's a reverb coming from the back of the room, it doesn't make any sense, man. I think you'd have to be all 5-1, or mostly, you know, say your orchestra, 5-1, um, and a lot of the percussion. It just sounds a bit odd if, if half of your, or not even half of your stuff's coming from the front, and then suddenly, there's some stuff being accessed at the back. So I generally leave that. I'm orchestrally, hopefully, I, I, I do projects which, which can allow me to record the real McCoy. Uh, and more and more... And am I right in saying you prefer Abbey Road as your... Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do only because it, it, it happened quite by chance. Um, you know, the first few times I was in the fabulous position of recording at either L or Abbey Road was with Hans, and they were on his scores because when I was assisting in Muppet Treasure Island in 1995 or something, um, it was one of the first scores to be recorded at all at air. And Hans slipped into being an air guy. So when I kind of grew up and had my own project, I thought, okay, well, if he's going that way, I better go that way. Just to save, you know. Oh, I mean, you know, we're going to double book at some stage because and they're going to say, well, I'm sorry, Harry, but we're going with him. Yeah, and I'm like, okay. But that, that actually happened with my engineer. I inherited his wonderful... Uh, recording engineer, mixing engineer, Alan Myerson, who's you know, he's a top, top guy with lots of experience. And you know, when I came to do my first few scores, I, Alan, I, you know, I was lucky. Alan was right there and he did them. And then there was going to be a moment when I was doing something at the same time as Hans and Hans would say jump and he'd, ha he'd, he'd go that way. So I think that moment actually might have been on Veronica Gurin, uh, which is about 90, late 90s sometime. And uh, I was headed to the airport here in LA to go over and record at Abbey Road and uh, Alan called me and said, look, sorry man, I'm just not going to be able to make it. Um, you know, Hans, whatever Hans was doing was taking priority, which was completely understandable, but something wonderful happened then, which was I called Abbey Road for, for, you know, and said, look, you've got to help me. I, d I don't know anybody in England I, who could, you know. And they said, well, look, there's this chap called Pete Cobbin. He happens to be like wondrous. Uh, and he happens not to be busy, he, he'll do it. And uh, I don't know, he's done 30 scores, he's my, my guy. He's my Alan, if you know what I mean. So, so it worked out really well for everybody, including everybody. Possibly the, the difficult thing with starting off as a composer nowadays, uh, as opposed to perhaps when I did it 20 years ago or whatever, uh, is that um, it seems like it's a race to get credits, to say yes to just about anything you possibly can, um, and to to get through it at all costs, as opposed to formulating a path, of an individual, unique path uh, that suits you as a composer. And, and, and ha, ha, it, it wouldn't it be wonderful if people had enough of a chance to, to learn the trade, very much like I did from Hans, and have a moment where they're not necessarily in the spotlight, but they're in the room, as it were. I mean, in those first couple of years, 1995, 1996, and the beginning of 97, before I really started doing my own projects, you know, I was fortunate to be Hans's guy, and that meant that I met Tony Scott. You know, I was then went on to do like 10, 12 feature films with the guy, and I, I didn't know I was going to at that time. I was just the, the guy at the back of the room, but Hans was doing a film called The Fan, and. Uh, that's not one of Tony's better films. And uh, I worked on, you know, I was ghost doing a bit of ghostwriting for Hans on that. And uh, I got on well with Tony when he came for the meetings, but you know, I didn't, I wasn't the fall guy, you know, it was all down to Hans. And it was fascinating to be in that position, to, to have that time, to be able to do things that, uh, that I won't say didn't matter, they did. You know, Hans was a hard taskmaster, but he was the fall guy. It was, he, he was in the driver's seat and I was able to, really observe what was going on and, and, and get, some, get some chops together uh, in terms of what the real job was. I mean, I remember him telling me it's, it's so, it's a much smaller percentage uh, of the whole uh, about composition. If you want to be a film composer, there's a large part of that, that's sort of therapist to the, to the director, um, that's a, a, an arbitrator to, between a director and a producer, you know, a, a salesman. I mean, you know, if you can't sell your music to a director, then you're not really going to get anywhere. You know, I always thought Hans could probably play a cue, at least a two-minute cue of silence, and get it, get it through, get it approved. <laughs> <laughs> He's a master at the 
the, uh, the approval process and all that. But there was plenty to learn there, and uh, I was lucky to have a moment to be able to learn it um, and not have the spotlight switched right on me immediately. Uh, I think that's really helpful. I think composing a little bit every day and trying to be aware of what's going on, because everything's changing so quickly, but you know, with your sample library, you blink and there's something else that's worth trying out that might complement what you've got. But to use those things as tools as opposed to allowing them to be distractions. You know, because I've got a harp sample, I've got several harp samples. I sometimes use the Spitfire one, I sometimes use an unidentified one that just says harp. I don't know where it came from. It was probably something I had in a 760 early on and got transferred to Giga Sampler and got trod, you know, whatever, to wherever we are today. But, you know, some things work well for other, but, 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 but in terms of harp, it is a harp. And I think in terms of the composition process, I'll probably grab the one that's closest to me and lay down the harp part and not worry too much about whether it's the best sound available yet and think more about the composition. And then, uh, remembering, <clears throat> you know, everything that, that was, was demanded of me when I started out in terms of the programming, then I'll focus in on making it the best possible sounding demo I possibly can. But then I, by that time, I kind of know what the music needs to sound like. So I, I'm not putting the horse before the cart, as it were. I think I realized quite late on that it wasn't a race to, you know, I'm not in a race, a foot race with anybody here apart from myself and not to be t so hard on myself that I think I'm already self-critical enough. I don't need to layer so much pressure on myself to think that, uh, you know, I, th I got to a stage before I took a sabbatical, um, so I'd been doing this 19 years straight. Um, where I was finding it quite difficult to compose because everything I composed wasn't good enough in my eyes and it wasn't, it just wasn't unique enough and it wasn't the way I wanted it to be. And I think that's all self-pressure. And I think after my sabbatical, I'd been able to breathe a little bit. And this isn't to do with, uh, you know, someone might say, well, you're lucky you get such great projects and you have, you know, it's not to do with that at all. Or it's not about finances or anything like that. It's more a mental thing about just allowing that love and enthusiasm, which I have always had, but perhaps has been covered up over the years with the pressure, as you very well know, um, uh, and the demands of, 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 uh, of being a film composer. So I think I've liberated myself a bit. And I, if I could have saved myself a few you know, <laughs> heart attacks along the way, that would have been quite handy. But uh, perhaps that's all part of uh, the rich tapestry of becoming a film composer, I don't know. And I'm sure there's plenty more of that, where that came from. I'm about to do Ben Affleck's film, and uh, he's a great guy, a talented director, very talented director, but he's definitely a taskmaster. So talk to me again in uh, six months. <laughs> Let's see what state I'm in. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Brilliant. Absolutely. Very,